I'd like to commence tonight's proceedings by acknowledging that I work on the land of the people of the Kulin Nation and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which you join us this evening. Good evening and welcome. My name is uh, Pip Nicholson and I'm the Dean of the Melbourne Law School. And it's a, a very great pleasure indeed to welcome you to the 2021 Harold Ford Memorial Lecture. I do regret that it's a virtual lecture. We had high hopes in July of perhaps being able to come together in person, but uh, it's not to be at this time, but perhaps next year's Harold Ford Memorial Lecture will indeed take place at the law school. In the meantime, let's enjoy being able to come together from our various places across Australia and indeed across the world. I would particularly like to acknowledge the work of the Centre for Corporate Law uh, in um, putting together and working with the Chief Justice on this lecture, and also to acknowledge uh, Clayton Utes, which sponsors the Harold Ford Memorial Lecture. And we are grateful to Clayton Utes for their ongoing and generous support. Before I introduce uh, our guest speaker and indeed also a chair for the Q&A following the lecture, I'd like to note a few housekeeping matters. You may have noticed that the chat function has been disabled. If you'd like to ask questions, and we do indeed encourage you to do that, can you please pop them into the Q&A function and we'll turn to them at the conclusion of the lecture. I'd also like to note that the, this evening's events are being recorded and uh, a copy of the lecture will be available from the website shortly. Now, let me turn to introduce uh, our chair for this evening and also Chief Justice Bathurst. Tonight's lecture, as I've mentioned, is indeed part of the annual Harold Ford Memorial Lecture Series named in honour of a distinguished alumnus of the Melbourne Law School, known to some I know who join us tonight, Professor Harold Ford. Professor Ford passed away in September 2012, but he spent almost his entire career at the Melbourne Law School following his appointment to it in 1949. He was Dean of the Law School in 1964, the year in which I was born, and he was again Dean from 1967 until 1973. And he is remembered by uh, very, very many, uh, perhaps all who have been taught by him as a particularly gifted teacher and remembered by generations of law students. In fact, I received an email just this afternoon from a former student recounting anecdotes um, about uh, his time in, in class with Professor Ford. Professor Ford also made uh, a very important and significant contribution to law reform and co-authored a number of influential works including a leading text, uh, familiar again to many of you I know, Principles of the Law of Trusts. So the Harold Ford Memorial Lecture Series celebrates the many contributions of Professor Ford to the Melbourne Law School, to the legal profession, to the development of corporate law and trusts, and to the students who were lucky enough to have been taught by him. Uh, we have uh, a couple of uh, speakers across tonight's program. Our chair following the Q&A is Associate Professor Rosemary Langford from the Melbourne Law School, who is uh, a member of the Centre for Corporate Law. And I welcome Rosemary and you'll be in her hands following the lecture. And as I mentioned before, the 2021 Harold Ford Memorial Lecture is generously sponsored by Clayton Newts, and we'll hear from Andrew Walker from that firm in the vote of thanks. But now it is a particular pleasure to introduce the guest speaker for this evening, Chief Justice Bathurst, the 17th Chief Justice of the New South Wales Supreme Court. After graduating with degrees in arts and law from the University of Sydney in 1971, 
Chief Justice Bathurst went on to practice as a solicitor. He was admitted as a barrister in 1977, specialising in corporate law and litigation and became Queen's Counsel in 1987. Chief Justice Bathurst's considerable experience in corporate law saw his appointment as a member of the Australian Government's Takeovers Panel from 2006 to 2011. Prior to his appointment to the bench, Chief Justice Bathurst served as a president of both the Australian Bar Association and the New South Wales Bar Association, the executive committee of which he was a member from 2002. Chief Justice Bathurst was made a companion of the Order of Australia in the Queen's Birthday Honours List in 2014 and elected as an honorary bencher of the Middle Temple in October 2016. Chief Justice Bathurst, we are honoured indeed to host you this evening for the 2021 Harold Ford Memorial Lecture. I'm delighted now to hand over to you and invite everyone here tonight to enjoy the lecture. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. Today I'm speaking from the Supreme Court of New South Wales on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any First Nations people watching today. Commercial trusts are a key and unique feature of the Australian commercial landscape. Despite their popularity, they are an imperfect vehicle for financial transactions and investments. The prevalence of trust in commercial transactions has raised important questions about how equitable doctrines apply to the modern world of commerce. Yet these questions remain largely unanswered. This evening, I will consider the difficulties that arise from the current use of commercial trusts from the perspective of beneficiaries or investors of, the, of those trusts. In the 1901 decision of Harden and Belios, the right of trustees to a personal indemnity from a beneficiary in respect of liabilities incurred by reason of the retention of trust property was described by Lord Lindley as resting upon the plainest principles of justice. Hardoon is authority for the principle that a trustee has the right to be indemnified by beneficiaries who are of full legal capacity and absolutely entitled for liabilities properly incurred by the trustee in the administration of the trust. The trustee is personally liable for debts incurred as trustee. This liability extends to any debts properly incurred in the course of carrying on the business of the trust and not merely to the extent of the trust's assets. The personal liability of beneficiaries is in addition to the trustee's right of indemnity from the trust assets under both general law and statute in all states. The principle in hard earned is relevant, where the trust is colloquially re referred to as, as, as insolvent. That is, where the trust assets are insufficient to reimburse the trustee for a liability properly incurred in the administration of the trust. This lecture will examine whether the application of the principle of beneficiary liability espoused in Hardoon to insolvent trusts continues to represent the plainest principles of justice today. My objectives are modest. First, I'll address the peculiarities that arise from the application of centuries old equitable principles and doctrines to the so called commercial trust. Second, I will illustrate the difficulties that arise from this. And finally, I will consider options for reform. In that context, I will also consider the de desirability of the abolition of the rule in Hardoon, as has occurred in New South Wales by the passage of Section 100A of the Trustee Act 1925. It is a great honour to have been invited to deliver the Harold Ford Lecture. Professor Ford was at the forefront of the development of Australian corporate law for many decades. His scholarship and leadership in numerous law reform committees played a significant role in the development of the law in Australia and educating generations of Australian lawyers. Professor Ford extensively studied the commercial trust in Australia, and I will consider some of his views shortly. Before we proceed any further, a few points of clarification may be useful. First, what do I mean by a commercial trust? It has become common practice in Australia to classify a trust as commercial or trading. This serves to distinguish a trust created predominantly for commercial objectives from the more traditional uses of a trust. This distinction between commercial and traditional devices 
was recognised by Lord Brown Wilkinson in Target Holding and Redfin, who noted that, and I quote, in the modern world, the trust has become a valuable device in commercial and financial dealings. And that specialist rules developed in, conjunction, in connection with the traditional trusts may be inappropriate for commercial trusts. Trusts are used in exceptionally wide variety of situations in Australia and other common law jurisdictions. Consistent with their origins, trusts remain popular in family and testamentary con contexts. However, in Australia, Australia, trust relationships also form an indispensable part of the machinery for many commercial transactions. Trusts are used in Australia for an incredibly varied range of commercial purposes. On one end of the spectrum, a married couple may use a discretionary trust in their small family-owned business to benefit themselves and their children. On the other hand of the spectrum, trusts are frequently used in superannuation funds or managed investment schemes. This lecture will focus on managed investment schemes structured as trusts and other commercial trusts. Secondly, despite its colloquial usage, the term insolvent trust is meaningless. A trust is a relationship that is recognised recognized by and enforceable in equity. It does not have legal personality and cannot be ins insolvent under the Corporations Act. In a commercial trust, it is the trustee which is typically a corporation that enters into contracts and transactions with third parties, as the trust itself lacks this capacity. The corporate trustee that owns property and rights and liabilities in relation to the trust, however, may become insolvent under the Corporations Act. The Chief Justice, Justice Keenan Edelman, in Carter Holt Harvey Wood Products, Australia Proprietary Limited, and the Commonwealth, noted, noted that the trust is not a separate entity and therefore does not have a separate solvency status from the trustee. The creditors of the trustee, in respect of debts incurred by it in administering the trust, receive protection by virtue of the trustee's rights of reimbursement and exoneration. Despite the te its technical ina inaccuracy, the term insolvent trust is commonly used in considering what is an insolvent trust. It is important, however, to focus on the assets of the trust, and particularly that those assets are insufficient to support the trustee's right of exoneration. When examining the current use of trust in the commercial sphere, it is useful to keep in mind the long history of the trust. There is a long held view that equity has no place in the world of commerce. This begs the question, how and why did the trust evolve, evolve into a commercial vehicle? The trust predates its better known competitor in the world of commerce, the corporation. Equity and the concept of a common law trust was largely devised in family and testamentary contexts in the Middle Ages. The trust proved an invaluable institution in preserving family wealth through the vicissitudes of life and to transfer intergenerational wealth. Concerns about liability were unnecessary in the traditional family trust of medieval England, where the trustee held land rather than active businesses and therefore rarely took on liabilities. As a result, the authors of Jacobs on Trust identify that the trust was not in its origin and perhaps never has been primarily a device of commerce. It is certainly true that the trust was not devised for commercial purposes. However, I think the current prevalence of commercial trusts in Australia challenges the idea that the, that the trust has never been primarily a device of commerce. Despite its origins in the family and testamentary context, the trust has played a significant role in the world of commerce for centuries. The trust was not only used for commercial purposes, but was critical in encouraging economic and financial innovation. When the corporation was, its in, was in its infancy during the 18th and 19th centuries, the trust was a real competitor to the corporate form. It is important to remember that limited liability of corporations is only a recent phenomenon. Trust law supplemented what legal historian Frederick Maitland described as the meagre law of corporations. Many industrial and commercial enterprises were structured through trusts known as deed of settlement firms. When the United Kingdom passed the first general incorporation statute, the Joint Stock Companies Act, trusts outnumbered corporations by a ratio of more than 10 to 1. At this stage, corporations did not yet have limited liability. The introduction of the Limited Liability Act heralded the start of the decline in the use of commercial trusts in the United Kingdom. 
In Australia, commercial trousers have been a prominent feature of the Australian commercial landscape since the latter part of the 20th century and have only continued to increase in popularity. The prevalence of commercial trust in Australia was described by Professor Ford as an Australian idiosyncrasy and by others as an Antipodean mutation, which has few parallels outside Australia. In 2017 to 2018, over 900,000 trusts launched tax returns in Australia, disclosing an aggregate gross business income of $394 billion. I note that this data, of course, includes all trusts and is not limited to commercial trusts. By comparison, in the United Kingdom, only 149,000 trusts lost tax returns during the same period. The difference in these figures can be hardly surprising when a leading English text fluent on trusts describes using a trust to carry on business as nowadays unusual. Trusts are popular as a commercial vehicle in Australia because of the unique advantages they offer compared to the corporation. In 1904, the Supreme Court of Massachusetts remarked on the ingenuity of commercial trusts that possess most of the advantages belonging to corporations without the authority of any legislative act and with freedom from the restrictions and regulations imposed by law upon corporations. Almost 120 years later, this still holds true in Australia. The ease of establishment, unincorporated status, lighter regulatory framework and more tax effective distribution of business income under a trust structure makes the commercial trust an attractive commercial corporate vehicle. As Nuncio D'Angelo has explained, commercial trusts prospered in the 1970s in Australia due to their favourable tax treatment. Natively, trusts provide corporate flexibility and asset protection while avoiding the regulatory framework that applies to corporation. To some extent, those benefits, of course, nowadays may be limited. However, the benefits associated with commercial trusts come at a price. The very features of trusts that make them so attractive also expose their participants to greater risk. By avoiding, by avoiding the comprehensive and policy-driven regulatory regime of the Corporations Act, participants in trust structures equally miss out on the protections that such regulation affords. There is a noticeable, noticeable lack of a comprehensive regime dealing with insolvency of trust. Given the origin of the trust, it is hardly surprising that trust law is ill-equipped to govern complex insolvency issues that arise. Traditional trust did not trade and did not have creditors, and accordingly, there was no need to develop an insolvency regime suited to trust and trustees. A comprehensive and relatively predictable insolvency regime under the Corporations Act applies in respect to companies in Australia. In contrast, there is no specific statutory regime for dealing with insolvency in the case of commercial trusts or managed investment schemes. None of the shareholders' rights or protections in the Corporations Act applies to investors in commercial trusts. It is important to emphasise that because of the nature of the trust, not all the provisions of the Corporations Act would in fact be suitable. Further and importantly, there is no statutory assurance of limited liability for investors in commercial trusts. In the absence of a comprehensive legislative regime regarding regulating member liability, the liability of beneficiaries is dependent upon the legal form of the scheme, the terms of the trust deed, and the characterisation of the interest in the scheme. When managed investment schemes are structured as trusts, as most are, trust law applies in addition to the statutory regime of Chapter 5C of the Corporations Act. But Chapter 5C, which regulates managed investment schemes, does not deal in any substantive way with insolvency. Justice Barrett flatteringly described Chapter 5C as flirting with the insolvency of managed investment schemes. The legislative framework does not provide for limited liability for members and ultimately managed investment schemes that become insolvent are governed by the general law of trust. The, reg the regulatory regime for trust effectively comprises decisions of various courts of equity over century with some overlay by state and territory trust legislation and Chapter 5C in the case of managed investment schemes structured as trusts. Further, until relatively recently, the decision of those courts of equity concerned trusts that by and large were not involved in commerce. Hardin Bellios was appealed to the Judicial Commission of the Privy Council 
from a judgment of the full court of the Supreme Court of Hong Kong. The appellant was the registered holders of shares in a company and held them on trust for the respondent, who was the sole beneficial owner of the shares. The shares were not fully paid up when the company went into liquidation. Calls were made on the trustee in respect of the shares in the winding up of the company. The trustee's liability to pay call, calls on shares did not derive from any decision of the trustee, but simply on, for, from holding the shares on trust for the respondent. After the trustee paid the calls made by the liquidator, he brought an action against the respondent beneficiary for indemnification. The Judicial Commission held the respondent personally liable to indemnify the trustee for the calls made. Lord Lindy stated, and I quote, the plainest principles of justice require that the City K Tricky Trust, who gets all the benefit of the property, should bear its burden, unless he can show some good reason why his trustee should bear them themselves. He went on, he went on to say, only, uh, where the only centenary tree trust is a person sui juris, the right of the trustee to indemnity by him against liabilities incurred by the trustee by his retention of trust property has never been limited to the trust property. It extends further and imposes on the Senate Key Trust a personal obligation enforceable in equity to, identify, to indemnify his trustee. Lord Lindley recognised certain exception, exceptions to his principle, namely that where property was held on trust for tenants for life or for interest, or in the case of special trust limiting the right of indemnity, where there was no beneficiary who, just, who could be justly expected or required personally to indemnify the trustee. The principle in Hardin is premised on, on the rationale that a person who receives all or part of the benefit of trust property must, must also bear all or the proportion of part of the burden associated with it. That was the basis upon which beneficiaries found liable to indemnify the trustee in Balkan and Peck. Interestingly, it's been suggested that irrespective of Hardu, the trustee in that case could have recovered on restitutionary principle on the basis that he paid money, paid over the trust assets to beneficiary in the mistaken belief that he, dis that he had discharged all liabilities incurred as trustee. If that was correct, the new section 100A of the Trustee Act would not have relieved the beneficiaries from liability. The principle applies irrespective of whether the beneficiaries requested the trustee incur the liability or the payment in question. The principle in Hardoon is well recognised in Australian law and has been applied to trusts with multiple beneficiaries. Furthermore, the New South Wales Court of Appeal has held that the liability of beneficiaries to identify the trustee extends to liabilities before the person even became a beneficiary. In Balkan and Peck, President Mason stated that it is understandable why Lord Lee, Lord Lindy, I'm sorry, emphasised the equitable basis of the right in the trustee context. However, the notion of a right to, con to contribution, recoupment or indemnity is not peculiar to equitable relationships. Such rights, unless grounded in contract or statute, derive from the unfairness of a person who gets all or part of the beneficiary of property or a legal transaction not bearing all or proportionate part of the benefit associated with it. That has some uh, relationship with restitutionary principles, of which President Mason was, of course, is, of course, a strong advocate, but I'm not going to go down that path tonight. Uh, Lord Blackburn, in the 1881 decision of Fraser and Murdoch, stated that the rule that a Senate Creed Trust is personally liable to indemnify the trustee for any loss accruing in the due execution of the trust is perhaps too broadly stated, as something might depend on the nature of the 140 years later, I think there is merit in Lord Blackburn's idea that the principle of beneficiary liability is too broadly stated and that something must depend on the nature of the trust. According to the logic of Lord Lindley, the obligation of the beneficiary to reimburse the trustee arises from equitable principles derived from the relationship between the benef beneficiary and the trustee, namely the profits of any go to the Senate of the Trust, the losses, if any, should be borne by him rather than by the trustees, providing the trustee was not to blame for causing the losses. Whilst this may have represented the plainest principle of justice in 1901, 
I'm not sure that it still plainly represents justice today in its application to commercial trusts. Let us consider a hypothetical situation in which the principles in Hardu would arise. The trustee, using its powers bona fide and exercising the requisite degree of care requires, enters into a particular transaction. The beneficiary did not request the trustee enter into the transaction, nor did they acquiesce with knowledge that the trustee was entering into such a transaction. A liability arises from this transaction that cannot be satisfied from trust property. Which of three parties should bear the loss? Should the trustee be required to meet such liability from its own resources? Or should it be entitled to indemnity from the beneficiary? Or should the loss resulting from efficiency in the trust assets be borne by creditors? These, these concerns are not new, and in fact many, many, mirror many of the reasons for granting the corporations limited liability. In practice, how do commercial trusts deal with the potentially unlimited personal liability of its investors? The trustee's right to personal indemnity against the beneficiaries can be excluded expressly or by implication of the trustee. In its usual and common commercial practice, to waive or limit the liability of beneficiaries by express provision in the constitution of the trust or registered scheme. In the case of a managed investment scheme, such a provision usually would limit liability to any amount that may, may remain unpaid in respect of member subscriptions for interest in, interest in the scheme, not dissimilar to the Corporations Act, and provide that members are not required to identify the responsible entity or creditors against any liabilities the responsible entity incurred in the course of operating the scheme. There is also a category of cases where the nature of the relationship between the trustee and beneficiaries is such that there is no right of indemnity. Lord Lindley, indeed, in Wise and Perpetual Trustee Co, recognised that the principle at Hardoon was not applicable where the nature of the transaction excludes it. Lord Lindley held that a social club, like other incorporated associations, is founded on the understanding that its fluid members are not liable to pay money beyond their annual subscriptions. Now, what is the difference so, between a social club and, for example, a unit trust where members are cons also constantly changing? On the face of it, the two do not seem so different. However, the decision emphasised that social clubs were not associations for gain. Unit trusts are not associations, however, their profit making objective may exclude the limitation of personal liability by circumstances. This begs the question, is the principle in Hardoon such a problem if it is possible to exclude the trustee's right to personal indemnity against the beneficiaries by express provision of the trustee? In my opinion, whilst this may currently be used to deal with this risk, it is far from ideal. This is for three reasons. First, a trust, trustee, like any legal document, may be poorly drafted. As a result, the extent of an investor's liability may be simply left unspecified or left uncertain. In my opinion, it is unsatisfactory that the current level of protection to investors depends on the competency of drafters. Further, even when it is specified, it is common in the, pro it is common in the product disclosure statement to disclose the limitation of liability with a condition stating the courts have not yet definitively determined the efficacy of this claim. In my opinion, it is important that investors can be assured of their potential liability to the greatest extent possible, and in a way that does not rely on economically inefficient and legally uncertain means of expressly incorporating a term in the trustee. Second, the uncertainty surrounding the expression exp effectiveness of the express limitation of liability clauses is compounded by the ex existence of a supposed broadly framed policy exception. Justice Young in McLean and Burns Philp cited two situations where public policy militates against a party limit, limiting its liability, being where the exclusion of liability is with respect to negligence or breaches of trust, and where such clauses are, such clauses are used as a quote a cloak for fraud. The, the uncertainty generated from such a broadly framed exception has been described as anathema to the commercial community. Finally, trustees that limit or exclude the trustees' right to personal indemnity against the beneficiary can pose significant problems for creditors who may be reluctant to conduct business with a trust if their ability to recover debt is limited.
The creditor's right of subrogation is wholly derivative on the, trust, on the right of indemnity of the trustee. Consequently, if the trustee's right of indemnity from the beneficiaries personally is excluded, then there is no right to which the creditor can be subrogated. Professor Ford, in fact, doubted whether a creditor can be subrogated to the trustee's right to personal indemnity from the beneficiaries. Leaving aside the uncertainty on this issue, if the trustee's right to personal indemnity was excluded in accordance with current commercial practice, then the creditor is, the creditor is unable to subrogate to this right. Some argue that the concerns of creditors have little place in the law of trust. Professors Ford, Lee and McDermott state, and I quote, that the fact that the trustee's right of indemnity has existed for the benefit of the trustee and not for the benefit of creditors who are owed debts related to the trust should not be obscured. Others argue that creditors are well positioned to take care of their own interests so they can continue, with, so they can control whether or not they lend and on what terms. Richard Tolson, the American jurist, argues that creditors may be, may be appropriate risk bearers because they are less risk averse than shareholders and a better, better able to appraise the risk. I do not think these justifications necessarily hold true in reality. Creditors, like investors, have varying degrees of sophistication and vulnerability. Whilst creditors can control whether they lend and on what terms, many trust creditors may be unaware that they are even dealing with a trust, particularly when they are dealing with a corporate trustee. If in fact creditors are aware of this, they may be unable to seek information about the trustee's right of indemnity and may not realise that their right to recourse against the trust assets are worthless unless the trustee's rights of indemnity are invaluable. Um, can I turn now to the public understanding of trust? In my opinion, it remains limited. Like creditors, beneficiaries and members of a benefit-managed investment scheme may also be unaware of the risks they're exposed to. Whilst the concept of limited liability of a limited liability company in Anglo-Australian law is well established and familiar to the public, the same cannot be said about trusts. There is a widespread recognition that many investors in commercial trusts are unaware that they face a potential liability beyond that of their intended contribution. A recent New South Wales Law Reform Commission report noted there is a common assumption of limited liability by investors in commercial trusts. Nilsia D'Angelo describes this as the parity myth where investors have been encouraged to regard companies and unit trusts and therefore shares and units as economically and functionally aligned. From the perspective of a lay investor, what is the difference between investing in a commercial trust and a registered company? Investing in a unit trust bears superficial resemblance to investing in a company. It is hardly surprising that investors perceive that owning units in a unit trust is the same as owning shares in a company. Ford and Hardigan have commented that the differences between trading trusts and registered companies are highly technical and outside the understanding of not only most lay investors, but also most professional investment advisors. Only when liquidation and insolvency rate supervenes will minds be concentrated enough to appreciate the technicalities. Even professionals working in the field mistake the natures of trusts. Just as Levy noted in a recent decision that both parties who were, who were accountants held the incorrect but prevalent notion that the trust is a legal person. If even accountants can be mistaken, it's hardly surprising that retail investors are under this illusion. The consequences of the myth of parity between trusts and corporations are significant. Unless an investor is familiar with the intricacies of trust law, they may incorrectly assume that their liability is limited to the, to the amount that they invest. Investors should know the extent of their liability. Otherwise, they are unable to make investment decisions based on, an based on an accurate understanding of the risk involved in dealing with the trust as opposed, as opposed to a limited liability company. This illusion of parity raises the question, is there a problem with the application of the hard earned principle in a modern commercial context? Or is the problem merely that the public does not understand the risks? If the problem is simply one of knowledge, then, imp then improving financial literacy will be an easy fix. In my opinion, improving financial literacy is always a positive outcome and would undoubtedly improve, improve public understanding and decision-making in this area. However, I doubt that improving financial education is a sufficient response. Professor Ford also considered this issue 
He stated in a 2010 interview that recent cases of failed managed investment schemes suggest that more need to, needs to be done to alert investors to the existence of any liability to pay more than the initial investment. However, he noted that there will always be investors who are unaware of the non-existence of free lunches and that it is hard to see how they can be protected short of requiring the regulator to vet the merits of particular investments, something which is not politically possible. I agree with Professor Ford that more needs to be done than simply improving financial education. Now, the legal and business communities have repeatedly agitated for changes to the status quo. Countless state and commonwealth bodies have toiled over the complexities of this issue and possible reform for decades. Inquiries have recommended that members of a managed investment scheme should have limited liability analogous to shareholders of a limited company. In 2015, the Productivity Commission suggested there may be merit in, in aligning the insolvency of, of trust with the regime for companies. Why has there been such stagnation? Despite decades of inquiries, the issue has limited public profile and consequently limited pol political will to enact ne ne necessarily complex and little understood reforms. Combine insolvency law with trust law, you have to have the world's most unexciting and complex areas in which we initiate reform. The terms beneficiary, sui juris and liability are not the glamorous discussion generating buzzwords government seek when spearheading reforms. Aside from this, it is hard to muster, let, let alone maintain public support of reform in this area, where many do not understand the need to make such changes. Another explanation for the paralysis is that quite simply there is no magic solution. The intersection of trust law and insolvency law is far too tactical and complex for that. However, after decades of signation, there has been significant progress, or some progress, I should say. In 2018, the New South Wales Law Reform Commission recommended the rule in hard and be abolished by statute. And that, that should be done through the Trustee Act pending Commonwealth action. In November 2019, Section 100A was inserted into the Trustee Act. It states that hard and bellious is abolished and also provides that this does not prevent a trustee from recovering any amount that a beneficiary under a trust is, li is liable to pay for a right, interest or other entitlement. And it does not affect any liability that a beneficiary under a trust may have in a capacity other than a beneficiary. Thus far, Section 100A has received virtually no judicial, co judicial consideration in this state. It was referred to briefly by the Supreme Court in Lou and Jeffrey No. 3, but only in the context of whether the liability of the beneficiary arose before the enactment of the section. It was also referred to by the New South Wales Court of Appeal in Chief Commissioner of State Revenue and Benny Dorm, where Justice Levy noted that Section 100A abrogated the rule in Hardu with retrospective effect. It is beyond the scope of this paper to deal with Section 100A in detail. However, as was pointed out by Professor Campbell, there may be a number of ways in which a beneficiary could be found liable to indemnify a trustee. Further, it is questionable whether in an area of considerable commercial importance, a different statutory regime should apply between states. Now, despite the entrenched nature of commercial trust in Australia, when considering reform in this area, do we really want to encourage the use of commercial trusts? Despite the many issues that arise from insolvent trusts, I do not think that the commercial world should abandon the use of trusts. The enduring nature and popularity of the commercial trusts demonstrates that trust law sufficiently in depth addresses some business needs in a way that is not possible under a limited liability company. Rather than trying to channel the commercial world away from what is clearly a very com popular commercial vehicle, I think we should encourage evolution in the law of trusts. I explained the reasons for that in the papers which I've delivered, but in view of time, I'll pass over that. Um, my paper will be uploaded very shortly. Um, I turn now finally to the question of whether there is a need for a form. In my opinion, it depends on the nature of the commercial trust. I do not think there is any need for a form regarding the liability of beneficiaries in all commercial trusts. For example, consider a block of land held on trust by a corporate trustee where the beneficiaries are absolutely entitled and sui juris. It is unlikely in an insolvency situ 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 situation 
will arise in those circumstances. However, I do not think reform is necessary and needed. By contrast, it's, the need is much stronger in the case of managed investment schemes and other publicly listed trusts. The illusion of many investors that investing in a trust is analogous to buying shares in a limited con corporation is deeply concerning. People who invest in those trusts would be staggered to know they could be liable over and above their initial investment. Reform is also more straightforward than other possible reforms, giving its present regulation under Chapter 5C, which already offers some protection for creditors. I do not think the common practice of limiting a scheme constitutions limiting liability is adequate. The fact that the trustees must be drafted by inefficient means to manage the risk. Whilst it is generally assumed that an express liability limitation of liability in the trust constitution would be effective, significant risk remains given the man, many issues that arise from poor, poor drafting, the legal, the, subsequent, the legal ingenuity of lawyers to get around them, and the subsequent risk of interpretation by the courts. The ambiguities associated with provisions supporting a limit beneficiary liability were recently illustrated by Justice Keane in Corder and Australian Executive Trustees. He noted that if a trust could be imputed, which, was, which it was not, a clause in the trust deed was not cast in terms which were apt to exclude an equitable obligation rest, which rests upon the plainest principle of justice. I agree with the remarks made by Justice Leamy that is to be regretted, especially in an insolvency context, where there is every reason to avoid litigation and focus on an efficient and cost-effective process. The position is presently as constitutional, um, contestable as it presently is. In that context, it must be remembered that only the High Court and Carter Holt Harvey Wood products only recently laid to rest the fallacy in E. Enhill that the proceeds of a trustee's right of indemnity could be made available the beneficiaries of all creditors of the trustee, not just those whose deaths were incurred in the course of the administration of the trust or for its benefits. In the paper I've delivered, I offer certain suggestions as to what reform should look like. However, in view of the time and the interruption which happened during the course of the um, lecture, I won't, go, I won't go through those. You can read them in the paper which, are, which has been prepared. I also put in the paper some reference to reform in various other jurisdictions. Because of the time limit, I also won't deal with those in this lecture. In conclusion, I recall that Professor Ford famously expressed grave concern that the fruit of this union of the law of trusts and the law of limited liability companies is a commercial monstrosity. This lecture has explored one aspect of this commercial monstrosity as it concerns potentially unlimited liability for beneficiaries and commercial trusts arising from the principles in Hardoon. In my opinion, reform is needed to prevent or protect investors who are under the illusion that investing in a trust is analogous to a limited corporation. This is easier said than done. However, I think it's not enough to simply abolish the rule in Hardoon. Any reform must balance the interests of beneficiaries, trustees, and creditors. Thank you for your patience. Well, what a marvellous note to end on. And can I just apologise too for the technical difficulties? It seems that even Zoom in Victoria is in lockdown. Perhaps there are new restrictions that we don't know about yet. Um, so these I, don't, are I don't know if Zoom New South Wales or Zoom Victoria. But... <laughs> Um, so th these are fascinating insights into a complex area, particularly given the limited judicial consideration of Section um, 100A to date. Um, we do have some questions, um, if you're happy to take them. Thank you. Um, firstly, yes. um, how urgently do you think the reforms are needed? Um, the problem's been around for a long time, which I won't view tends to suggest it's not. but. That's been in the context where we haven't had significant commercial lockdown, um, shutdown since the GFC. Uh, where they will become urgent is where, and it will happen, there are collapses of one or more of these trusts and people will be looking, creditors will be looking to wait for a cover. And there will be real consideration of whether, um, for example, beneficiaries are liable, whether the um, the in, of exclusion provisions of the trustee are effective. Um, it'll, it'll undoubtedly occur. And there is also problems which I've raised tonight about um, 
uh, problems of preferences with, with credit, intratrust and uh, commercial creditors, uh, non-trust creditors. Uh, re as I said, was only uh, recently um, overruled by the High Court. Um, I think it's relatively urgent. Hmm. Well, thank you. Um, so thank you, everyone, by the way, for your questions. Another question, Chief Justice, is uh, an anonymous attendees pointed out 25 years ago, it was possible to enact uniform laws of trustee investment. Why is it now too hard to enact uniform indemnity laws, particularly as many trading trusts cross state boundaries? Of course, this is an issue that arises in a, in a number er of areas of law. <laughs> it's probably a good question at this particular time in history. Um, look, the short answer is uh, I, I don't know. I think it's a matter. I mean, I think the, the starting point is that trust, trust law, the administration of trust law, falls within state jurisdiction rather than federal jurisdiction. Probably, um, that's the first issue. The second issue is that um, the Commonwealth law, law reform bodies, probably because of that reason, haven't shown any interest in doing so, and states have gone in their, in their separate ways. And the underlying politics of that, I don't know. Uh, I think the New South Wales Law Reform Commission thought it was preferable to do something rather than do nothing, and we know what they did. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's desirable. Indeed, I think ultimately it is essential um, that... Um, there be uniform reform in this area because piecemeal reform, I think, will create more problems than it solves. And it's easy to see it as, as the question has said, um, state large trust trade across borders and internationally. Thank you. Um, another question, and I won't be able to take all of them, I'm afraid, is um, we've got a question here about the distinction between commercial trusts and traditional trusts. Do you think Lord Brown Wilkinson's distinction is workable? It's a, it's a, handy, it's a handy generality, but uh, uh, and it may show, it may de demonstrate. So the answer is no when one deals with the general law of trusts. Where what it does show is that you can perhaps hive off a particular type of trust for reform, and as I think I said in the paper, uh, ref the reform in the, in the uh, managed investment scheme, which could be done separately uh, as registered schemes, is a desirable starting point. But otherwise, I think that the distinction must be fluid. Uh, it can be the small business, uh, a single investment. So uh, I have difficulty with it. It was helpful for what he was doing in that case, of course. Hmm. Uh I'll, I'll put one last question. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them and I apologise for that. Um, so the final question is, if a trustee's right of indemnity from a beneficiary is founded on principles of equity, what is inequitable about limiting that right in the trust deed, given the trustee assumes the role with knowledge of the terms of the trust deed? There's, no, there's nothing inequitable, I don't think, about limiting the right. Uh, that's not going to be the problem. The problem is that people are going to do their best to um, circumvent it. Uh, I must say, with respect, I was a little bit concerned about Justice Keats' remarks. I mean, if it's a precursor to say these, um, these uh, clauses should be um, interpreted as a referendum, as it were, I'd be troubled by that. But um, it does show the difficulty. I don't think there is anything inequitable. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Um, and I'll now pass over to Andrew Walker to give a vote of thanks. Thank you, Professor Langford. On behalf of Clayton Utes, I'm very honoured indeed to propose a vote of thanks this evening to His Honour Chief Justice Bathurst for a most illuminating presentation. We are certainly indebted to His Honour for adding to the learnings in this fascinating area and for giving of his valuable time to speak at this event in honour of the late Professor Harold Ford. Professor Ford certainly would have shared your honour's amusement with the traditional view recounted that equity had no place in the world of commerce, just the vicissitudes of family life. Your honour's observations regarding the rich history of commercial trusts, 
and the Australian idiosyncrasies and peculiarities described by your honor were a revelation to me and I'm sure many others in the audience. Particularly your honor's cautionary words regarding the lack of general public and perhaps even professional awareness of the investment risks involved and the possibilities for reforms. And I look forward to uh, downloading and reading the full paper which his honor has kindly provided. I expect that Professor Ford would have been quietly pleased with your honor's uh, numerous references to his seminal work in this area on his affectionately titled commercial monstrosity. As the Dean mentioned, Professor Ford had a long association with the university and the law school, uh, serving as chair of commercial law from 1962 to 1984, and as dean of the law school from 1967 to 1973. Even these very impressive statistics scarcely do justice to his achievements, which were perhaps best described on the occasion of his passing by Justice Dodd Streeton, when Her Honour described Professor Ford as the undisputed founding father of modern Australian commercial, commercial law, whose contribution to corporations law over six decades was unequaled and whose influence was impossible to overstate. I had the privilege of meeting Professor Ford at the firm in the late 80s and of working with him from time to time in the first part of the 90s. In a period when the use of trusts in commercial enterprises was fairly widespread, perhaps due to the tax benefits alluded to by the Chief Justice, I was constantly struck by Professor Ford's mastery of both company law and the law of trusts, being the principal author of the then leading texts in both disciplines, and his unique understanding of the interactions between the two. Indeed, such was his standing in the legal profession, a notoriously combative profession at times, that any debate on matters involving trusts or company law could be settled with a simple invocation, this is the view of Professor Ford. Perhaps even more remarkable was that for, for all of his greatness, he was a true gentleman unfailingly modest and courteous and very generous with his time and intellect to lawyers young and old. So in closing, could I first thank the Dean, Professor Nicholson, and the team at the Law School who coordinated this event and navigated the various technological challenges. And whilst we were unfortunately unable to welcome Your Honour in person, your virtual presence here uh, is enormously appreciated and certainly continues the fine traditions of this lecture series in memory of Professor Harold Ford. At this point in proceedings, I would normally invite the audience to demonstrate their appreciation to His Honour Chief Justice Bathurst, uh, but in the circumstances, Your Honour, I'm afraid that I'll have to invite Your Honour to imagine what I'm sure would have been a rousing round of applause and settle just for me saying, Thank you very much indeed and good night.